So next up, we came up with a theory called molecular orbital theory. Now this is going to be an advancement on the valence bond theory. And in molecular orbital theory, we're going to take those atomic orbitals. And off to the side, you'll see we have atomic orbitals filled up for oxygen. So we're just looking at our 2s orbital and our 2p orbital over there, right? Well, if we were to take atomic orbitals for each of our two atoms, and here I'm going to try to make the oxygen molecule in a second, we're going to combine the orbitals of two oxygen atoms. And when we do that, don't forget that these orbitals all had a node or a lobe of it that had a positive or a negative sign. Remember the red shading or the blue shading, that sort of a thing. And when we combine those two signs, remember this is in charge, those two signs of the wave function, we can have constructive and destructive interference. In other words, if I bring uh, an S orbital close to another S orbital and they have the same sign, they're going to constructively interfere and make what's called a bond. If they have opposite signs, they're going to destructively interfere. That's actually going to be known as something called an anti-bonding orbital. It actually kind of means that they're repelling each other. Uh, so what we're going to see is, if I go ahead and get that second oxygen atom showing, you can see the second oxygen atom over here. We have each of the two atoms filled up with their electrons. And that's what you're seeing in the left-hand and right-hand columns of this image. Now what we're going to do is say, hey, if these S orbitals interact with each other in a constructive way, that's actually going to make them even more stable. So it's going to drop down in energy, making this sigma bond. And notice the sigma comes from the same letter as S. Now, if they destructively interfere, it's actually going to undo the bond that we just made down here by breaking it with this section that's repulsive between the two. That's called our antibonding orbital. So we have our sigma bonding and our sigma antibonding. Now, if we fill up with our 2s orbitals in this case, notice that we filled up all of our bonding orbital and we filled up all of our antibonding orbital. If that's as far as we went, that would actually just mean that these two atoms looked at each other, didn't find anything in common, and didn't make a bond at all. However, we have to keep going, right? So when we go further up, we'll have our next one. Now, end-to-end -end overlap. So with a pi bond, remember, if they're pointing the same direction, we'll have end-to-end -end overlap. That's a sigma bond. Edge-to-edge -edge overlap, like this, from the two p orbitals that are up and down or in and out, those would be off to the side. And they're going to be less stable. Those are going to be pi bonds. But our p bonds pointing toward each other will be overlapping directly, making a sigma bond, uh, yeah, sigma bond in that point. So we'll have our sigma bond fill up. Then we'll have our pi bonds fill up. Again, we can have antibonding pi orbitals. And then we can have antibonding sigma orbitals. If we had enough electrons to fill all the way up to the top, well then, notice that would mean that we'd had a full 2p orbital over here. And if we had had a full 2p orbital here, those would have both been noble gases, right? At which point we're basically saying, hey, if I set a noble gas next to a noble gas, it's going to fill all the way up through all the antibonding orbitals. They're going to bump into each other. They're not going to form any bonds and it's going to fall right back apart. Now, in this particular case, you can see with the uh, O2 molecular orbitals that we're forming. We had our sigma bond form up here. That's our first bond. Then we have two orbitals here of pi bonding, second and third bond. And you might be looking at me like, wait a minute, oxygen doesn't have three bonds. Don't worry, we're getting there. Next up, we're going to have two bonds of antibonding. Those two half bonds, half full orbitals, total up to one bond, right? And it's an antibonding, meaning we took one of those bonds and we took it away. So this theory also tells us that we have a double bond on our oxygen, just like all of our previous orbital uh, theories. And so that's what our molecular orbital theory is set up to do. Now, depending on the energies of these, I and mean, we could have different atoms, we're just going to stick with diatomics for now, but we can have two different atoms here, and then you'd have to find kind of the median energy for that, and that gets a little bit more complicated. You can see examples of that in the textbook as well. But we're going to say with a simple case here, two heteroatoms making a molecule, so oxygen and oxygen, we're going to just have them fill up like this. Sorry. We're going to have them fill up like this. We're going to count the number of bonding and antibonding orbitals we have, and finally that's going to tell us what the total bond order is. Remember, this goes back to what we've talked about with bond order previously.
Now, if you want to think of it like that, you could think of this as having plus one down to zero, plus one bond to three, and then you can think of it as two half bonds, if you'd like, for the bond orders. Either way, if I subtract two halves, that's subtracting one bond, it still tells us that we're going to have a double bond. Two constructive bonds, the no, three constructive bonds, one destructive bond gives us two total bonds. That's the idea of our bonding and our anti-bonding orbitals. Uh, we don't need to go a whole lot further than this, other than me to point out, um, depending on what atoms you're using, you can have a slight inversion of energy between this pi orbital and the sigma orbital. You'll see examples of that in the text. Uh, just as a quick joking way of reminding these in my head, I think of this as being the tree shape. It's got a little trunk here, gets bigger, then comes small, get the top again. We can also have what I call the totem pole where it's narrow, narrow. If the sigma pushes above the pi, notice the pi would be too wide, and the sigma would be one wide then wide again to two, then narrow again to one. So it almost looks like a totem pole where So that's kind of the way that I keep in mind those patterns. So that's the basic idea of molecular orbital theory.